BMW has an ambition, and it's a big one, to become the most sustainable car company in the world. But to find out how achievable this goal really is, we've invited author, activist, educator and climate optimist Anne-Therese Gennari to go on a journey into the heart of the BMW universe to investigate for herself. And I have plenty of questions. Ready to hit the road? Once I've announced the title, sure. <laughs> Welcome to Chasing the Greenest Car, a BMW podcast. Very well done. I'm not just here to keep you company, you know? So I can tell. Are you ready now? Hey, I'm waiting for you. Wonderful. Well, let's go then. Chasing the Greenest Car. A journey with BMW. Episode 2. How do we turn production green? Hello, I'm Anne-Therese Gennari and I'm going on a journey to find out what BMW are doing to create what they call the greenest car. The world is obviously facing a climate emergency that isn't going away. But I am what I like to call a climate optimist, which means I believe that the best way to improve the future is to face those challenges with a positive attitude. Adopting the right mindset emboldens you to take action. And while it sounds like BMW are taking action, I still have a million questions, and I'm not just going to take their aim at face value. There are a lot of challenges to overcome, and I have no idea what the car of the future should look like or even if it should look like a car, or even be one. On this journey, I will hopefully find out. So, today I'm driving the electric i4 to the BMW Group Plant Munich. I'm going to be talking to experts in sustainability and green production, and it seems like the best place to do it, right where the cars are made. So then, green production. If BMW is working to produce the world's greenest car, we need to get to the bottom of what that really means and what the challenges are. Anne Therese is on her way to meet the people who know the answers to these questions and an awful lot more besides. So here we are, the BMW group plant in Munich. Got any information for me about this one? Well, I can tell you it's the parent plant of the BMW Group, and it's located in the immediate vicinity of the Group headquarters, the BMW Museum, and BMW Welt. Approximately 7,800 employees from over 50 countries work on site, and every day 980 automobiles are manufactured here. Oh yeah? That's a big carbon footprint to offset. Anything else? And BMW has been producing vehicles and engines here since 1922. This year marks the 100th anniversary of the Munich home plant, and it's both BMW's origin and its future. A hundred years. Wow. Well, let's take a look. Obviously, this being a place with lots of heavy machinery in it, Antares immediately went in search of the noisiest possible location to conduct her first interview. And boy, did she find it. Well, what we see here is uh, in, the, in the plant Munich, the BMW part of the body in white, where the, the parts of the body, the steel parts of the body are welded together. And therefore also we have some noise behind us. But I think it's an interesting area to talk about what means production, sustainability, etc. Following a literal green path, directly above a small army of robotic arms working on the plant's production line, she also found Yuri Vichnik. Yuri is Head of Environmental Protection and Energy at BMW Group. And the topic of sustainable production is a major part of his work. So you, you're literally hands-on creating the future, in a way, in, yeah. in your day-to-day -day job. Yeah, directly hands-on, because um, what we define is, for example, long-term targets. What means sustainability, um, what challenges are relevant for BMW, for the production, for the product. And we define some long-term targets in, in terms of sustainability, for example, reducing uh, water usage, uh, having less waste. And 
the hands-on means uh, setting these targets and developing measures, activities, together with a large group of teams of developers, of uh, very intelligent uh, and smart people to bring solutions for those challenges and for those targets for the future. So you already mentioned water and energy, but what are some concrete challenges that you might be working on right now that you're trying to find solutions for? One of the most important challenges today we have in the automotive industry, but also in the complete area of the society is uh, climate change. And therefore, most of the topics we are actually doing are towards uh, reducing our CO2 emissions. And that means our actual topic is, in terms of sustainability means, um, what can we do to em emit less CO2 in production? and other areas, not only production at BMW, but also in, in the car and in, in the, the supply chain, for example. Seems like a big mission. Anyone who's tackling climate change at the moment, I feel like it's always the balance between being overwhelmed and also incredibly excited, because if there are many challenges, there are also room for a lot of opportunities of doing things differently. Is that how you work for the most part? Exactly. And uh, one, one of the challenges first um, translate the complexity of sustainability to a few specific points where we can act. For example, as mentioned before, emissions, energy, water, waste. These are the most important topics today. So make it uh, less complex and then be active and show the people what we do and giving them also an example for, for their own activities. Um, also, for example, for our suppliers, what we do, can they also do? And also for the people who buy our cars to say, yes, we buy a car which is sustainable, not only the product itself, but also the way it was produced by uh, the production at BMW, by the production at our suppliers. And this means for us uh, being active in different ways and translating this complexity to specific activities. So where does green production begin and where does it end, in your opinion? So for us, sustainability begins in the design. In the design of the mobility, design of the car, the product, and then all these steps behind. Um, what kind of materials you use? How are these materials produced, used in our own production? And at the end, of course, what is the user, the customer doing with this car? And giving him uh, or her the best product, um, having in mind, okay, when I use this car, I can be sure that this company was acting before and uh, designing before all these different steps from material to over the processes in the production to what he gets, she gets when he buys a car and drives the car. In which stages is it already completely green, the production, and which stages would you say are more difficult to accomplish and why? This is a little bit difficult to say here we have 100% and here we have 10%. I would say um, we are never perfect because sustainability is changing. If we go 20 years back, we had different topics of sustainability as we have today. And if you go 10 years in future, sustainability will also be different because we have solved some of the problems today. Where we are quite good is, for example, in reducing CO2 emissions. We, we started many, many years ago in reducing our energy usage. Um, other topics is reducing our water usage. Water is not that much what we need, but we need water and therefore uh, we try to reduce uh, the amount of water um, a little bit more than two cubic meters per car. It's much less than a private household has in, in usage per year, but it's necessary in the production. But the less we use, the less um, water risk we have on the one hand, and on the other hand, for example, we, we try to reuse water. So reduce, reuse is one thing we always try to do and we did that and we came down, have a lot of efficiency. I'm just curious because you said you reduced the amount of water being used for producing a car and although that's lower than a household, I'm just thinking there's probably a lot of cars being made. Are there any numbers for approximately how many cars you produce per day? We um, showed these numbers in the company report. And uh, we have worldwide um, more than uh, two and a half million cars, more or less two cubic meters per car. That means overall we have about five million cubic meter water, um, more or less worldwide in usage. And this is a lot. Per car it's very low, but in total it's a lot of water. And therefore it's important for us to reduce the dependency on water 
and uh, water is much more important for other other usages and therefore we also try for example not to use drinking water potable water we try to use the groundwater and there are a lot of things still we have to do and can do some plants already have 50 percent or more groundwater they can use uh, but other plants uh, still have the opportunity to do this way to go this way and this is for example something we always try to getting better getting better and improve our activities and again just a reminder that one unit may not look like much, but when it adds up, it becomes pretty significant. And it just speaks to us as individuals too. We may feel like our individual actions don't matter, but really when they when we come together and start making change individually together, it actually surmounts to a pretty significant impact. So just a reminder again, that looking at the small changes sometimes create the bigger changes too. Exactly. And this is always, uh, even we are quite good in some topics, better than others. We are benchmark, we are using best in practice technologies. We still strive for getting better. Would you say one of the biggest challenge is to standardize across borders? You are a multinational company. Do you feel like that provides a challenge or maybe more so an opportunity because you can collaborate? Yeah, I, I would say standardizing is, um, is an opportunity. It's one, um, one activity how to get better. Um, it's not one standard uh, you can uh, uh, use in every plant because some technologies are already uh, uh, realized, others are not. And plant by plant, some plants are maybe three years old, other plants like here in Munich, it's 100 years old. So it's a little bit difficult to change these technologies. And, uh, and the question is, what is the roadmap to do that? Takes it five years, takes it one year, takes it 10 years? And the standard means also having a standard, having an idea of what is best practice and where we go for. And I love that you said, you mentioned it briefly, but I just learned this morning that actually this factory that we're in right now is celebrating 100 years yeah. this year, which is amazing. And I saw a sign on the wall, the other door that said, what are the next 100 years or something like that. And it just put for me a vision of, yeah, we've been here for 100 years and here are the next 100 years. We're not going anywhere. And so I just wanted to pinpoint that I'd love to have that vision of if we want to still be here, not just as a company, but as a world and a people, we have to start taking bold changes now. And so I just wanted to plug that because it fuels my optimism to be able to be here and see that firsthand. My final question to you, because I feel like you will give a good answer to this one. We'll see. Not to lay it up too heavily, but what makes you excited about the future? There are a lot of challenges which could make you depressive for the future, but um, I think we have a lot of very smart people and excited is if you can see day by day that these people can bring solutions. It takes time, it takes smart people, a lot of smart people, um, and if you can see that if, if you give them the, the space for, for creativity, they bring you solutions with where you are excited about them. And that makes me very proud that also, for example, I have a small team and in this team, um, very, very uh, professional people with, which bring those solutions. And that's really something you, you say, okay, that's why I want to wake up, go to work, work with these people and bring the next thing done. I love it. The journey is underway and you are definitely surrounded by a team of people who are pushing that journey forward. So it makes me excited as well. After parting ways with Yuri, Anne Therese went to find her next contact at the plant, but found herself briefly distracted by all the work going on at the assembly line. We are back inside the factory and we're looking at something that looks a lot like cars going by us. I'm just amazed by what these engineers are doing to these uh, assembling of the cars. But we're not here to talk about cars right now. Well, actually we are. We're here to talk about production innovations with the wonderful Magdalena. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me here today. I'm very excited. It's still correlated, Antares. Anyway, Magdalena Lippenberger works in BMW's Department for Sustainability and Production. And her mission is to push for innovations to create, you guessed it, a more sustainable production across the whole BMW network. Um, so I'm very happy that I had the chance here in this kind of job 
to combine my expertise, which I gained innovation management in the last years, with my personal interest in sustainability. Because what I'm really doing is I'm finding and pushing innovations that will help us to save energy in production, to decarbonize our production, and um, also to find more solutions in the field of circular economy. Yeah, so it's the perfect combination for me because I am talking a lot to the colleagues in the whole network, in the plants and in, in the planning departments. And then together we, we learn about new things every day and see which ones are the ones that will help us to really get more sustainable in the future. And your main focus is sustainability throughout the production. So what are the more difficult areas that might be not so easy to make sustainable at first glance? So if you look at the plant and the different technologies we have at the plant, uh, really the most challenging for us is the paint shop. Because here um, the, the cars are painted and we need a lot of heat in the drying process and in, in all the processes in the paint shop. And so far it, it was just a very effective and also just a state-of-the-art solution to heat the burners with fossil fuels, with natural gas. And um, so for us the challenge is to, to substitute that, to find new possibilities here. And it's also not that easy because it's a big infrastructure that we already have. You can't change it just in a day. Uh, that's the one thing. And the other thing is that there are not the solutions already on the market that we need. So we really have to start and develop new burners, new ovens with our partners uh, that we can use then and then uh, substitute that kind of energy as well in our plants. Can you give some examples of what kind of alternatives already are implemented today? So um, let me give you three examples. Um, it's a question that's very different for every location. So it's very special for every location. What do you have available as energy source? So if we look at our plant in Steyr in Austria, the plant will source 100% renewable energy by 2025 and already um, purchased um, green electricity since 2017. And here we are um, slowly changing to uh, district heating from biomass. So that's the solution here, the biomass. Then in our plant in Leipzig, maybe you have already seen some pictures sometime. You see some big wind turbines next to the plant. That would be the plant Leipzig. And um, yeah, those four wind turbines already have been in place and, and produce some green energy here. And then a totally different uh, location is our plant in Mexico, in San Luis Potosí. And here, of course, we have a lot of sun in Mexico. And that's why we are using a lot of solar power here. And actually, San Luis Potosí already gets the 100% of the energy from solar panels. Some of them are on the plant and some of them come of an outside solar park. So when you are looking into new innovations, what sources do you use for that? Like, how do you identify, like, this is a new innovation that yeah. we should be acting on? Yeah, we have a really holistic approach to look at that. And so, um, first of all, we look at what uh, internal sources of uh, innovation do we have. And we already do have a lot of colleagues uh, that have very great ideas. And so the first thing is to enable the colleagues to, to implement the innovations. So what we do here, for example, is we have a process where colleagues can pitch their ideas and then they can get funding and support to, to start with their project. And then, of course, we also look externally for new innovations. And there, we also have a lot of partners. We, for example, look into academia with our um, university corporations. Um, we look at startups also a lot. We'll come to that in a second. And also, of course, other big partners, our suppliers, uh, where we just uh, find innovations together. And uh, for the startup part especially, we also have different approaches to work together with startups. So on the one side, we have our accelerator unit, Urban X. Then we have our venture capital unit, um, iVentures. And then we have the BMW Startup Garage, which is a venture client unit. And what I'm looking uh, most at is really if a startup has a product that can help us to um, be more sustainable in production. So what does it take for a company, a startup, to become part of the startup garage? 
Yeah, so I would say, um, as any time when a startup partners with a big uh, company, the first requirement really is to bring motivation and to, um, yeah, to have an inspiring idea that really convinces us as a customer. And then when we look at sustainability, it's just very important that the startup really helps us to, yeah, to reach our goals here. So to help us in, the, in these fields I already mentioned, so energy efficiency or decarbonization or circular economy. For us from production view, it's always also important that it's a scalable solution uh, that we not only can use it at, at one place, but if possible also in, in other plants. Returning to the far quieter environment of the I-4, Antares made a call to her final expert of the day, Stefan Fenchel, who heads the Green Plant Project in Leipzig. And when talking about sustainability at BMW, one location that cannot be overlooked is the Green Plant. It's BMW Group's pioneer plant for e-mobility and one of the most sustainable automobile plants in the world. Stefan, how are you doing? Thank you, I'm very fine. So on BMW's mission to be the most sustainable premium car manufacturer, what exactly are you doing to achieve this goal? Yeah, that's where it becomes a bit more difficult because sustainability is such a broad issue. So the Green Plan project in Leipzig covers or sees it more like a holistic approach to sustainability. But to make it short, the two main stories that be that shaped our past and will shape our future in Leipzig is on one side like a a responsible um, dealing with um, environment and nature and industry in that sense. At the same time, also pushing forward the vision of a zero emission plant. That is a dream. This plant was originally set up already in the early 2000s. And we are writing this story continuously. And it's called the, I might butcher this one. You can just call it the green plant. But Grunus Work Leipzig <laughs> It's the name of the factory. Yeah, Grunus Work. Green plant is fine. Grunus Work Leipzig, okay. Do you want to say it the right way? <laughs> As a green plant, it's just green plant, Grunus Work, direct translation, yeah. What he said, direct translation. There you go. And this is a pretty famous plant when it comes to BMW. Can you tell us why this is? Well, I think the, the reason is because it was set up and planned out in the early 2000s and the managing, I might say the fathers and mothers of this plant, the managers who were in charge back then, had a huge amount of foresight and looking into the future and what is going to be demanded of us as a company and of a production site being built up in an industrial country like Germany. And therefore, there were some unique features engraved into the foundations of this plant. One is, for example, like we had these kind of uh, 250 apple trees planted on site. Like, why would you do that on an industrial site? It just goes more into the topic of like, you know, um, biodiversity issues that we have intensely discussed nowadays. And on the other side, to think like, what does zero emission factory actually mean? So in the early 2000s, we really thought about how would it be possible to build wind turbines, renewable energy, implement renewable energy into our energy system. And that was at a time when it seemed rather impossible to do that. We did it. So how does this plant differ from other BMW plants? Can you give some concrete yeah. examples? Well, the unique and the unique visible thing that you see when you look up the BMW plant in Leipzig is that we have four wind turbines on site. And, and wind turbines on an industrial site are, are unique because theoretically there's no legal possibility to set them up. And because the, the region, the city of Leipzig and the local authorities found a way to integrate wind turbines as our local energy system. And I think that is still rather unique in Germany. Therefore, we're kind of the groundbreaker for this kind of development. Other unique features is you know, our second life battery farm, I don't know, but we come to that. Like, how do we deal responsibly with, um, with the high voltage batteries that come out of electric cars? What could be a second life for them? How can we reuse them in our energy system? And of course, the biggest story that we started in 2013 and we're continuing to write is uh, the coal of the future, hydrogen, the use of hydrogen in industrial applications. So you said that when they started this plant in 2000, they had a vision of what the future might ask from the company. I mean, it might be hard for you to answer this, but do you think that the current 
reality, like the future, the present, is that the future they were expecting or what has changed and how will you continue to look to the future to, um, to continue the journey of the Green Factory? I think, as I mentioned before, the people who invested their energy into shaping the what we now call the past of the plant were really good in their job. I, I personally talked to them, I interviewed them myself to ask them, like, how was it? How was the struggle? How were the responses from the environment to say we want to build up uh, for wind turbines? And it was interesting to hear that there were obstacles and there were objections and they had to be overcome. And now it is one of the praised highlights of the BMW production sites. And I see this as a great encouragement, like when you are on the forefront of a development, especially when it comes to sustainability, you don't expect everybody to just cheer you on. There will be objections, you know, it is a change and not everybody agrees with you. And therefore uh, it takes courage, it takes a group of motivated people to come together and it takes an ambitious goal. That's what I think we have there. So for anyone who's listening who has that bold, crazy idea, do not take no for an answer. I would agree with that, yeah. Yeah, I agree. And so right now you have wind turbines, you have a battery storage farm, you have Germany's first indoor hydrogen filing station for logistic vehicles, and you produce the BMW i vehicles at this plant in Leipzig. Can this production culture be easily applied to all BMW plants, do you think? Or what do you see like other challenges in replicating what you're doing there? It is part of our production system approach that we don't just copy and paste, but we, we, we like to see like what really makes sense in, in terms of the, the regional aspects and so on. But when we talk about technological advancements like the hydrogen interlogistics or what we're working right now on, we do think like how is this adaptable into other areas, into other plants. So the production system is worldwide pretty much compatible with one another. That is preconditioned so we can build cars everywhere and adapt to the market demands as well. And the same thing is true for our production technology. So when we say hydrogen in interlogistics, yes, this is adapt adaptable in, in every other plant and there's right now programs running at the plans to, to adapt that. Do you feel like the future car is smaller than we might be used to today? Uh, again, there's a regional aspect. You, if you look at different uh, continents, there's different demands on, on how big a car should be. When you look at the i3, it was developed for mega cities, particularly compact and so on. I don't think there's a general answer to that. I think it's more important to look at the carbon footprint and the carbon footprint of the whole car. It starts with like what materials go in there, what is the consumption, what is the whole aspect of the whole process lifetime. And then size, if you look at a country like the United States, size in most areas doesn't really limit anything, unless you live in New York. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, if I ever get a car in New York, it needs to be easily squeezed into any kind of sideway parking, because otherwise you can struggle for hours. So, <laughs> If you would still want to have your own car, that's the other thing. Like the whole, When we talk about cars, we say we, we rather want to talk about mobility, like how can we offer the right mobility for the right case? And that has to be fit to the customer who actually demands the car. Right, and it's again, it's looking at mobility, not the car itself. And that again says that there is no one size fits all or one answer fits all. It depends on who you are and where you live in the community and in the world around you. And if you could make one decision for the company today that would be implemented tomorrow, you had the power to do this, what would that be? I mean, this is strongly connected to what I'm doing right now. I do believe that hydrogen is the coal of the future. That was first said by Jules Verne in 1875. And we believe that and we will see a transformation of electromobility towards fuel cell electromobility, a topic that's highly discussed right now in the media. And I would love to see that progress. I think this is the way into the far future. There's a lot of boundary conditions that are not there yet, starting from infrastructure, green hydrogen, and so on. We're not just there yet, but I think developing that future is worth working on. Can I give you a picture that, that matches? This is also might be fun and entertaining for everybody because here in Europe we sometimes discuss hydrogen as the champagne of, of the future and so on. And uh, some people, a professor actually from Japan recently said that hydrogen is cheese because it's just like when you have milk, fresh milk, you cannot preserve fresh milk for a long time. So that's why you make cheese out of it to have milk, let's say, in the winter. That was back in the olden days. And in a, in a renewable energy society, 
electricity is like milk and hydrogen is like cheese. It's basically <laughs> like stored energy because it's very, very hard to store electricity. And that's a good picture to help, like, say, what to believe, like, why hydrogen will play a major role in energy uh, of the future, energy systems, including the sector of mobility. I can tell that you have seven kids, and sorry, I'm bringing this into the show, <laughs> but you are just so good at working with like puzzle pieces and think of it as electricity is milk and hydrogen is cheese. I will remember that now. That is such a good image. Stefan, thank you again so much. It's been so great chatting with you and uh, keep up the good work. We cannot wait to see more of these green production sites in the future. My pleasure. The search for the greenest car is a search that is taking place right now in reality. But it's a search that begins in the imagination. What is the greenest car? How does it look? How is it built? What goes into making it and what happens to it after? Take a moment to think about the future. So for long term, uh, vision is um, having no CO2 emissions in our activities. And this is one aspect of green. And then coming out the topics where we want to be better and better, like water usage or energy usage, for example. If I would step into a plant, a new plant, or also an existing one in, in some years, um, I would look around and I would see a really green plant. So it has the color green. So I would see some nature here also, some colleagues that can take a break in the spots of nature. Um, but I would also see green energy, so what we already talked about, maybe I would see the wind turbines or I would see the solar panels around me. Everyone really is committed to, to these principles of sustainability um, during everyday work. BMW has very ambitious goals to say we want to have the whole carbon footprint from the sourcing of the material all the way over the use phase into the recycling to reduce that significantly. And a production facility is a very complex energy system. With another step of the journey complete, it was time for me to seamlessly prompt Anne Therese into some kind of summary. So how did you enjoy your day at the BMW Group plant, Munich? It was loud, but good. Did you find out what you wanted to do? Yeah, I think so. I'd say my top three takeaways are that there's not one size fits all solution when it comes to green production. Transparency and standardization are vital and they seem pretty serious about their sustainability goals and about using renewable energy. Care to elaborate? Okay, well, take production. The biggest challenge right now is reducing CO2 to fight climate change. And there are plenty of areas where they're working to lower their emissions, which is a start, but they're also looking at energy and water usage as well as waste. So, I mean, they're all connected and there isn't one solution that will solve all these different things. Every solution is based on external factors and over time, these factors will change. What about transparency and standardization? Those two came up last time as well. Well, it makes sense. So many people and organizations are involved in various processes. Transparency and standardization are the only ways to measure the value of your actions. Which brings us on to sustainability goals. Exactly. I mean, BMW want to achieve carbon neutrality, and they're certainly being hands-on about getting there. It's interesting that they're looking ahead also and recognizing that there are other aspects beyond CO2 when it comes to sustainability. Sounds like a day well spent. I think it was. Okay, so where to next? Well, that's the production side of things covered. Next, I think it'll make sense if we go and see what happens at the other end of a car's life. Ah, so recycling then. Makes sense to me. And me. Then let's go. Yeah.